Hello, guys. So today I'm here with Rob Goodwin. He has an excellent YouTube channel. I suggest you go follow him after this um, video and check out what he has to offer. He's got some really good information, great videos. So Rob is a PT, Thank you. A fitness expert in general. Um, this is since 1994, before I was actually born. So he actually knows his stuff. <laughs> um, so Rob, what is your current training plan? Well, uh, as you said, I've been uh, doing this for about a thousand years. I'm a kind of a dinosaur in the industry, but um, for nearly my entire career since, as you suggested, 1994, uh, actually, just rewind, uh, I started training back in 1994, really caught the bodybuilding bug and got absolutely obsessed with it. But uh, from the start, oddly, it was never about competing with me. Uh, I wanted to conduct the experiment when I got into bodybuilding and just became a total complete, you know, addict in the sport. Um, it was always about being on the other side. And I liked the experiment, not only with my own personal physique, but working with other people, not necessarily even competitors, but just anybody who were looking to make a dramatic change in their physique, because I was able to do it with myself. And to be fair, uh, when I started, I think one of the reasons why I got so heavily into it is because I realized I was a bit of a hyper responder myself. Uh, I got results fairly quickly. And being that it was in 1994, Dorian Yates was the current Mr. Olympia at the time. And um, I gravitated towards his blue collar, lunch pail, you know, blood and guts mentality. I, I, I really like that work ethic. I like that grit. I like extreme things. So I instantly became a Dorian fan. And then as being in 94, he was sort of taking some advice around that time from Mike Menser. And uh, so I started devouring everything I could from Menser, Arthur Jones, Dorian himself, Dorian himself and several, several others. And, you know, back then we didn't have the internet. So to learn, uh, you had to travel, you went to seminars, you literally picked up that telephone thing that was connected to a wall and you called people and did consultations and asked questions. So I took a deep dive and, and traveled and did everything I could, became a trainer uh, because everybody in the gym saw my results. And they were like, you know, back then it was like, well, how are you doing that? Will you train me? And so I did. And so I decided to become a full-time trainer and, and devoted everything to that. And when I started delving into the high intensity method at that time, it just made the most logical, rational sense to me. And the way it was explained to me, and I had the honor and privilege of being able to consult with Mike Menser himself. I had three consultations. I literally called a phone number in the back of Muscle and Fitness Magazine, and that's how we connected. And you literally you know, give him a credit card number over the phone. And uh, I had three consults. Two of them were over the phone, and then I took a trip to Venice, California, and was able to do one session with him at Gold's Gym Venice, which was you know, quite life altering at the time to be in that presence in that facility, in that era, in the nineties culture. And uh, so I sort of took that and ran with it. I got amazing results from that style of training. Um, I absorbed everything I could about that style of training. And uh, so it's been my training philosophy and protocol for nearly 30 years now. And I've never deviated from that. And the funny thing is, um, throughout most of my career as a coach, I really started coaching a lot when the internet wave took off. And when I sort of became somehow sought after because of the way I was combining a ketogenic diet with high intensity training. And I just always kind of flippantly said, I like a lower volume, higher intensity protocol. That's just what I do. I never really explained it. I don't know why. I just, because I guess that's what I've always done. And I kind of got more uh, popular in the ketogenic world and that whole ancestral health movement, never really talking much about the high intensity training. And that's how I kind of got my feet into the industry and got sort of known. And then more recently, after I sort of retired from competitive bodybuilding, I've, I started, you know, mentioning more so that I've always been into high intensity training. And then the floodgates opened again people wanted to know more about that. So recently my, my interviews that I've been doing and people have been calling me and emailing me wanting to know how am I combining carnivore ketogenic nutrition with this super high intensity training? And here we are. So, I mean, I, I'm trying to cover 30 years of career here in just a few minutes. So I hope that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So 
essentially you're a high intensity trainer. Um, I've got quite a few subscribers that have been asking about that. So I thought you might be one of the the better people I can access to get on to talk about that. Outstanding. So what I wanted to know was how how do you use high intensity training to elevate your sports performance, your muscle growth? So what what say are there three key things that you think are pertinent? I think the most critical thing here, obviously, and let's get this out in the open now because everybody's going to want to know about the whole steroid thing. Um, I think if you're competing, obviously this kind of training, as far as I'm concerned, will work for anyone. But I also feel that if you're just just a guy or a woman in the gym, you're drug free, you're living a normal life, and you're just trying to put on the most amount of lean mass possible or preserve the most amount of lean mass possible, um, then I've always believed because this is just the way I started and because I've studied under some of the greats in the high intensity movement, that that was going to be the best approach, especially if you're a natural athlete. Now, if you're taking compounds, which that's fine, I don't judge anyone for that. If you do that, great. If you don't do that, great. But obviously we know that if you're taking anabolics, it's going to, there's going to be a heightened recovery process, obviously. Um, but I believe if you're a natural athlete, I think one of the major problems that most people have, and they wonder, why am I not getting the results that these guys, the guy in the Instagram that I follow, or this IFBB pro follows. And I think because, especially for the natural trainer, you're not giving the body proper recovery time to let that overcompensation occur from the stress that you're applying, uh, to the body through your training. And then I think another thing that I always talk about and it's really, really hard to get this notion into people's heads and make them understand where I'm coming from. But when we talk about taking a set to failure, and just for your listeners who aren't completely familiar with high-intensity training, it's about only taking one dramatic all-out set to total complete failure. And I kind of do it the way Dorian did it, where I will do one or two what we call feeder sets that I do at about 60 to 70% of my max, so it's not super stressful. And I do that just to get loose. I'm old now. I just turned 54. So uh, I do that to kind of get loose, get my muscles primed, and more importantly, to get my head in the game. Because most people don't understand what true failure is. To reach that point of absolute true momentary muscular concentric failure, and even if to take that beyond that, if you're incorporating some high intensity techniques into the into the set, like a forced rep or heavy negatives or a rest pause set or a cluster set, to be able to take that to true failure is a difficult thing to do because we have the central governor in our brain and it's a defense mechanism where the body will want to shut down when it feels like it could be under a level of stress that may result in damage. Now, we obviously are trying to damage the muscle in a structured way in order to cause overcompensation to occur, to occur. But most people, their brains will shut down before the body. And they may say, oh yeah, I took that set to failure. Did you really? It took me literally over a year to, to where I truly got to where I could take a set to what it, what true failure was. And then I had to keep even working on that over the years to be able to take my mind to a place where I could physically and mentally subdue myself or subject myself to that level of intensity where I would get beyond what my brain was telling me or when my brain was telling me to stop and take a set to true failure. And, and I think you really have to understand what that is and take it to that point. And most people not only don't understand or have never truly uh, taken the time to develop that, but many people just don't want to go through that level of discomfort. And you know what? That's fine. It's like I always say, this stuff that I do or this stuff that my clients do, it's not necessarily possibly for everyone. And that's okay. Not everybody might want to be on a carnivore diet like I do. Not everyone may want to be on more of an ancestral health or ketogenic diet like I did for years and years. And that's okay too. But if you are seeking change and what's working for you isn't working, then the way I run my business is I say, hey, let's try what I do and what I've kind of been thrown onto the landscape for and see if it works. And so I have this group of clientele. I, I have about a hundred people that I work with online and I have a private gym here in the States where I work with people on the workout floor from, as we discussed, 4.30 in the morning till about 
one o'clock. And uh, so these people have an interest in what I do. They see the results that I have gotten and other clients of mine I've gotten, and they want to put it to the test. And I think that's great. Another thing that I always fight about in this industry, and we can talk about it, is this whole dogma and zealotry that's in the fitness and nutrition landscape. And that's a separate topic and we can go down that road and, and I kind of hope we do, but um, ju just to, to kind of answer your question, uh, it just has worked so profoundly for me. It has worked profoundly for others, but I think before you travel down that road, you have to understand the toll you're going to have to pay. It, you know, you got to pay a toll and you got to get on that road and you have to understand where that road's going to take you. And it might not be for everyone, but for those of you who are truly trying to conduct that experiment and achieve the maximum level of muscularity that you possibly can, uh, you've really got to focus on that recovery method, but it's also got to be under the uh, understanding that you've pushed that set to the absolute point of total momentary muscular failure. And there's a process involved of getting to that. I hope that makes sense. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, I'm half your age. You shouldn't know. Um, I probably look only very slightly younger than you, so I can say you look very radiant and healthy for a man of 54 years. Um, so good for you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I really think that has to do with uh, the way I eat, obviously, or the way we eat. And um, I want more and more people. Uh, you know, it, it's as simple as we believe this shit. Can I say shit? Can I do that? Um, we believe this stuff because we've applied it. And the thing about the internet, the thing about social media, the thing about YouTube, which, and I love all of it because it's like a gun. You can either save somebody with it or you can destroy somebody with it. The problem that, that I see is we have so many people within the industry infighting and it just drives me insane because I, I did a t an interview with Ted Naiman. Some of your listeners may know who he is. Some may not look into that. I did an interview with him and when we were off air, he gave me this incredible compliment and I truly appreciated it. And I'm never looking for a compliment. I got in this business 30 years ago to help people and to conduct this experiment that mm. I was so passionate about. And he said, you're sort of the antidote to that whole ketogenic zealot community out there. And that meant a lot to me because I knew what he meant because yourself, you're doing important work. I think that I'm doing important work. But there's so much infighting because of this internet medium. We all want the likes. We want the follows. We want the subscribers. We want the thumbs up. We want the comments. And we're always talking about that to increase our influence. But we have to stop and think that our influence needs to be positive at all times. And so many people want to strike such controversy within the space that we're all in because there are people out there eating a standard Western diet and completely destroying themselves from the inside out. They're digging their graves with their teeth. They want the solution, but the powers that be keep feeding them lies to make them think that the stuff that we do is so far left field. Why can we not stop fighting amongst ourselves? You know, the, the carnivore community is starting to really piss me off. And it's because, you know, some, I, I saw a guy today on Facebook. I have a big Facebook group of like 12,000 people that's called the ketogenic bodybuilding Facebook group. And I saw another guy in a corresponding carnivore group, just berating people for eating, for drinking coffee. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. I mean, I think if I know somebody may have taken, do you know who that was? Okay. He's, a, and he seemed, he's a friend he's, of he, mine, but I couldn't understand how he, he's annoyed a lot of people, I think. He's a, he's a cool guy and I've talked to him a little bit and I love what he does, but then like three or four posts will be cool. Cool. Yeah. That's great. People need to hear that. But then he'll go on some tangent where it's like, okay, you're going to berate people for drinking coffee. How about the person out there that is, you know, completely metabolically deranged needs a solution, needs to gravitate and, and, and grasp something, a movement that can help define them where they have support and people out there that can really assist them on their journey. And, you, you know, it's kind of like you're trying to coax a squirrel to eat out of your hand. You don't want to make any big sudden movements and scare the mm -hmm. shit out of them. So you might have this person that's on the outside thinking, well, that kind of makes sense. Maybe I might want to try that. And this might, and then someone says, 
And if you're drinking coffee, you're a fucking asshole. Okay, fuck you. And then they go about their business. It just drives me insane because I think I can let it go. If one of, if I don't agree with drinking coffee, which I do drink coffee, if I don't agree with it and one of my clients have switched over to an animal-based diet, a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, they've lost 25 pounds, some of their metabolic derangement has subsided, they're going down a path to health, they're changing things, they're training in the gym, they're, they're doing the things they need to do. And I drive them away because I told them they were stupid or ignorant for drinking a cup of coffee. Then I need to kind of check myself because that kind of infighting within this community, I think is going to cause more issues than, than it's worth. A, a perfect example is Paul Saladino. And I can call him out True. by name because he, because he's famous. Yeah. You know, that whole eating four or 500 grams of, you know, fructose and, and fruit and all this honey a day. No, I don't agree with that. It would not work for me. It would not work for the majority of my clients. But to totally dismiss him and rip up his carnivore card, I don't think is the right approach. That's why when my clients come to me and say, hey, this Paul Saladino guy is telling people to eat, you know, one, two, three, four, 500 grams of fruit a day. I'll say, yeah, that's, that's right. And here's why I don't think jumping off that ledge will work for you. But to that end, it may be okay for someone to take in a small amount of fruit in small quantities to a certain level of grams within their carnivore ketogenic diet and be totally fine with that. I've kind of got on the landscape because I combined what I called a hybrid ketogenic diet with bodybuilding kind of tr style training. And I did say and admit and advocate, and I still do today, that a little bit of carbohydrate in the right amounts, the right types around training could be beneficial. And not only that, if you are a physique competitor, you're going to stand on a bodybuilding stage. I think some carbohydrate around training is critical. And I also think carbohydrate as a carb up before you go on stage is absolutely essential for most people. And I'm not going to back away from that. I'm not going to be one of these dogmatic zealots that says, nope, just meat and salt for the rest of your life, or you're an idiot. I mean, that would be doing such a disservice to most people out there in this space. So everybody is an individual. Everybody's decent or a different. So we can have an umbrella with some bullet points and some guidelines that even those might need to be adjusted, but to totally dismiss somebody and push them off this cliff because they had a handful of strawberries, or they might have had a squirt of honey before they went and did a 600 pound deadlift. I'm not going to fault them for that if it in fact is working for them. If I have a client who's dropped 25 pounds, their metabolic derangement has subsided, their blood markers are fantastic, they're performing outstanding in the gym, they're getting all the benefit that they wanted from my program, and they decide they're going to have a rice cake and some honey before they lift, or they want to have you know, uh, two handfuls of blueberries with some yogurt once a day and everything is still working perfectly. I'm not going to be that guy that says, nope, that doesn't fit into the guidelines that so-and-so wrote down on these 10 commandments. Mm -hmm. I think that's insanity. So I think we all need to unite. Otherwise we're just these crazy vegans. You know, you, there, there's the mm -hmm. running joke that, you know, you wonder if somebody's vegan. Oh, don't worry. They'll tell you. They're going to find a way to tell you. They say the same thing about CrossFitters. You want to know if somebody's a CrossFitter? Don't worry. They'll tell you. Well, I don't want us to turn into them. I don't want us to be these, these preachy zealots that you know stand on the mountaintop and wag their fingers at people and tell them that, oh, if you didn't do this exactly the way I do it or the way so-and-so wrote in the tablets of stone, then you're a freaking moron. I think that's going to do mm -hmm. more damage than good. And I think we need to move away from that. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean... You saying that just sounds like you've read my mind almost. Um, <laughs> there's been, I think, two videos out that I've been in where I've sort of said, you know, everyone sort of bashes Paul for having fruit and honey. I'm like, well, if he's going to be like introducing people into that diet, it's a stepping stone into carnival. You know, it's it's a step yes. ahead of what they're doing before. And the same Perfect. thing with, you mentioned about the zealotry. I completely agree. Um, I mean, I made a visit video recently on the Randall cycle. And I sort of said, you know, um, I called Paul out. Uh, didn't bash him negatively as a person, but, you know, I just said what I had to say. And right. I said, yeah, you might be able to include fruit and honey and 
whatnot. But that's that's going to be make it more access, accessible as a diet to you. But you know, if you want the best optimal health to long term outcomes, it's going to be through a carnivore diet. Um, that's what my opinion is, anyway. Um, so what's 100%. your current diet? Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Hmm. My current diet is, is uh, it's, well, th that's a great, that's another great, you're going to get me off on another rant. Um, Do you eat random stuff as well? Um, I eat primarily beef and eggs. Beef and eggs would be my absolute staple. I might have that two, three times a day. Now, uh, I think the best way to explain it is to say of my very carnivore-ish diet, which I would say is 90% carnivore, I would say of the of the meats that I consume in that meat and egg realm, I would say of the meats I consume, probably 70% is beef from ruminant animals. And the other 30% is just a mixture of other animal-based foods, proteins. Like I might have some poultry, I might have some fish, I might have some pork, uh, I might you know have some turkey, I might throw those in. And there are people out there that would tell me I'm not carnivore and I got to tear up my card because I might have some chicken thighs, which is insanity to me. And then the only other thing that I yeah. occasionally have is I will, I do, I am a fan of dairy, but I will only have like full fat, uh, organic Greek yogurt. And I might now don't lose your mind. I might have a handful of organic raspberries in that full fat Greek yogurt a couple of times a week. I haven't died yet. And uh, I'm still performing pretty well at my age and my blood markers are perfect. And it's just a tiny amount. And there are some weeks where I don't have any. It's just how I feel. That's probably the, the, the most anti-carnivore thing that I do. Mm -hmm. I think raw milk is a spectacular thing to consume. And over here in the States, depending on what state you live in, it, it is literally can be illegal to get raw, raw dust. milk. And you have to go to a friendly farmer. Okay. So you have to go to a friendly farmer here that is willing to give it to you. And the bottles have to be marked not for human consumption, which is just insanity to me. But I think because I have a bodybuilding background and I know how those the, the nutrient partitioning works, I think raw milk could be one of the most anabolic foods that you can consume if you can get it. So, you know, steak, eggs, and raw milk might be, you know, if I could have those three things three times a day, that would be the staple of my diet. I can't always get raw milk, so that's not always in there. I don't drink um, homogenized milk you get from the store, but I might have some goat cheese or some organic, you know, uh, cheese, aged cheese, the good stuff, not the not the shit. Uh, but for the most part, it is meat and eggs, um, and and that's about it. It's pretty basic. Now, the other thing, I'm not a big intermittent faster. Now, I know that's another commandment breaker for most people, but I believe if, you know, people like yourself, people like me that love to train, that train intensely, that train heavy, and our goal as it should be for especially anyone over the age of 40 is the preservation and any addition of lean mass that you can possibly put on. Sarcopenia is a real thing. The inevitable loss of muscle mass that every human being with a pulse will experience. Now, the goal should be to slow that process as much as humanly possible. And we do that by what? Lifting heavy weights, getting adequate sleep, and getting adequate protein. And I also believe, and the studies do support this, that too much fasting or too much intermittent fasting may not be the best thing if the goal is to try to put on lean mass. And some of it may be the fact that for almost 30 years, I've been eating several small meals throughout the day for muscle protein synthesis. And I still do that to this day. And there's never been any detrimental side effects from that. And I don't think I'm killing myself by doing it. And the other thing I would throw into that now to, to, to back up that. So I'll eat, you know, I'll get a whack of protein early in the morning when I hit the gym floor. And then about every three or four hours, I'll have a small meal that's very carnivore. That's how I eat. And then before I train, I may have a small amount of carbohydrate on those days that are especially taxing. Like if on leg day or back day, I may take in 15, 20 grams of carbohydrate. That could be cream of rice. It could be a rice cake, uh, something of that nature, or it could be just a, like a cyclic dextrin powder uh, that I'll have pre-intra workout that to help for that 
to fuel those super high intensity efforts. And here's the thing for people out there who are already wagging their finger at me. I take in an amount that I know will be absolutely gone by the time I finish my last set of that workout, which will net in a zero side effect principle for me because I'm using it as a tool at the right time in the right amount for a very specific purpose only, and then it goes away. So it has worked very well for me. So I like having a little bit of carbohydrate in a timed, you know, in a structured amount with a heavy whack of sodium right before I train 15, 20 minutes. And that's always worked very well for me. And that has worked very well for some of my clients. But you, what the other thing I want to throw in there, I do have, I do have some clients that if they did that, they would go into a total carbohydrate tailspin and they'd be wrecked for the rest of the day. So what do I tell yeah. those clients? Don't do that. Those people do better with something like some MCT oil and some black coffee. <gasps> Sorry about the coffee thing. I know that's not allowed anymore, but um, that might work well for them. And then after training, they go back to their normal, either ketogenic or carnivore protocol that we have prescribed for them. So um, that that's the way it, it works for me. That's brilliant. Yeah, I love your approach. I mean, you got what my audience need to think is that Rob is someone that has been training for a long period of time. He's not come to these conclusions just by happenstance. You know, he's he's obviously like me, like he's very calcul calculated. His ideas are thought out and he's doing it like he said in a structured principle. So um the thing the thing about my diet is I notice that I'm one of those people that can't tolerate a lot of carbohydrates. Um I will right. blow up and I can't train in the gym because I get too pumped. <laughs> um, essentially my, my muscles are like it sucks having blue. that problem right it's it's good to like looks and stuff but it's not great for training because you know you want to get muscle nice and short um the next question i had was in regards to specifically fat loss like altering body composition so when you're coaching a client what is your what's like your first thought so someone says oh, i'm eating this this and this and this um say you don't like what they're doing it's wrong um in your opinion, what was the first thing you look at to change? Well, when we decide what approach we want to take, and that typically, to be honest with you, comes just from their input. A lot of times, just because of where I've come from and where I've been in the industry, people will come to say, come to me and say, I've heard, you know, I like the ketogenic diet idea. I like the carnivore diet idea. Carbs don't really work well for me, but I want to train hard. I train in the gym. This is about performance. Or I want to compete. I want to do a local show. Or I've got a photo shooting coming up. Or I've got a, you know, a wedding I have to go to. And I want to be, you know, just spectacular. I want to reach my genetic best. Then usually when they come to me and we determine what they want to do, I, I explain what that's going to look like in general. And then we just determine. Now, I, I still also believe it, you really need to determine, do we want to go into a gain phase where we're trying to put on some mass or are we at a point where we need to shed some body fat and go into more of a, of a deficit and cut. And um, I know I won't be able to use those exact words when I talk to Bart K, but, uh, huh. but you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. But uh, so, and you know what, and, and to Bart K's credit, don't even use the word calories. But if you talk mm. about just the amount of energy you consume and the amount of en energy, energy your body puts out, you can't, he's right. You can't really go by this caloric number because there's so many variables at play. It's just like body fat. When a client says to me, well, I got on my body fat scale that I bought for $30 and it told me my, my body fat was you know, 24%. Can I keep using that? I'm going to say, I have no idea if it's 24% and it probably isn't. I don't think we exactly know what your body fat percentage is, but you can use that scale just as a gauge or just like a, a barometer of that things are going in the right direction, even though we know the number may not be specifically accurate. So I can work with a client and say, we need to take in a little less energy or we need to put in a little bit more energy into your body based on what you want to do. And then we look at the division of macros. If I still think protein is king. I do. I, I think protein is the king macronutrient. And I focus on that first. And I look at hitting a protein requirement based on the goal first. Then we bring fat into the mix as a viable energy source and for hormonal health. 
So we kind of, you know, shift the knobs on the fat intake relative to what the goal is. The protein number is going to be relatively, relatively the same, whether you're trying to focus on lean mass gain or body fat reduction. We use that fat dial to sort of determine how much energy from fat we're bringing in or how much we're dialing it back based on what the goal is at the time. And then carbohydrates, as I discussed previously, is strictly a performance tool. And it may come into the mix for some, or it may not come into the mix at all for, for others. I literally have some people ingesting five grams of incidental carbohydrate a day, just from carnivore sources or things that kind of you know sprinkle their way in incidentally, or we have a calculated 15, 20, 30 gram of carbohydrate influx according to that individual's goals and needs. And then we may even adjust that as we go as well. So the coaching is pretty meticulous into how those macros are allocated to their diet, depending on what you know uh, cycle they're in in their training and what their goals are. And then obviously, I think if you're a good coach, you have to make sure that as you're moving down the tracks with this client, you're willing to make adjustments accordingly. I'm not going to be one of those coaches that says, okay, we're we're definitely going to be at this many grams of protein, this many grams of fat, this many grams of carbs. And that's what I determined. I know, I know best. And that's where we're going to stay. We bring them in at a certain number based on the statistics and the information that we have at that time. And then I'm always cognizant that we're going to make small, subtle changes as we go based on the feedback that I can continue to get back from the client, which is just generally always visual inspection. I want to see photos and progress pics like any prep coach would. And then I want to ask them things like, how do you feel? How's your performance? How's your sleep? You know, how, and, and if they've had previous issues with maybe like anxiety or depression or, or sleeplessness or things like that, we want to see how those things are changing or becoming better or might maybe becoming worse. And then we make adjustments as we go. I think it's arrogant for a coach to say it's this number all the time, or it's only these foods, or it's only this because I am God and I know best. I think that's doing a disservice to the client and it's all about the client's results. I'm going to say what I think is best for the individual that I'm working with, not what's going to make me popular. I would rather be far less popular and or completely unknown in this social media space and know that my clients are getting results or that I'm getting results or family members that put their faith in me are getting results than to come up with some philosophy that I say is all my own and this is what I do and you'd better buy it and pay $19.95 a month or you're going to die. And, you know, back to Paul Saladino and the liver king and these guys, I think one of the reasons why Paul Saladino is so fruit, honey, fruit, honey is because I think he's a great marketer. He's a businessman. So is the liver king. The whole thing with the liver king is a shtick. You know, it's a performance. It's an alter ego. So I think Saladino thought, okay, I'm sort of being lumped in with all of these other carnivores because it's gotten so popular. I need to find a way to shift into a way that I can be a little bit more unique. So now he's taken the whole animal-based thing, making it his own, saying now it's about meat, organs, fruit, honey. So now he's got his thing. So, and he's done great at it because when you think of Okay, people that eat an animal-based diet, meat, organs, fruit, honey. Who's the first person you think of? Paul Saladino. That's that's who you think of. Whether it's right or wrong, he has made an adjustment in his marketing to pull people into his space to do what? Buy his products, buy his supplements, buy his programming. And the Liver King's done the same thing. And the Liver King's worth how many millions of dollars? I mean, come on. It, it, it's a performance. It's a stick. He's found a groove. He's found a niche. The liver King, it's about primal. Well, he kind of took what Mark Sisson brought into the landscape back in 2004, and he put his crazy theatrical spin on it, and he just amplified it. He turned it up to 11, and he's profiting huge off of that. So, you know, it's not about the popularity of the coach or being some sort of a social media celebrity. It's about... I'm going to tell you what I think is best for you. Now, if I do an interview with you two years from now, and if what I said on this broadcast, I feel I was wrong, probably the first thing I'm going to say is, hey, it's great to talk to you again. Oh, before we begin, I want to say I'm sorry when I said blah, blah, blah. 
I was wrong. The research has proved that my experience in the trenches working with clients has shown me the error of my ways. And now this is what I believe based on making a slight shift in my philosophy and what I do with my clientele. So. Perfect. Yeah. You've made some really, really clear and precise compelling arguments for what you're saying. I mean, I'm seeing so much dogmatic behavior and it's frustrating. I mean, the idea that we should all just consume, you know, meat and water and salt. Come on. We've all got different genes that mean we require different amounts of different vitamins and minerals and, Right. You know, you'd be daft to think otherwise. I know for myself, someone that suffers with autism, chronic fatigue, um, I know that I have a higher requirement for omega-3. My detoxification pathways are trash. So I have to right. elevate my diet in certain aspects to achieve what I want. Um, so before I wrap this up, how can people find you, Rob? Well, uh, if you go to robgoodwin.com, R-O-B-G-O-O-D-W-I-N, that's got pretty much everything. Um I've really fallen in love with this YouTube thing. So uh, you can find me there as well, as well as I do a lot on Instagram. And uh, one of the things that's still going really strong is I started a podcast a couple of years ago called the Ketogenic Bodybuilding Podcast. And I've been kind of amazed that so many people seem to, to like it. I've gotten over 100,000 downloads in just 30 episodes. And uh, I probably get a hundred emails and messages a month just from that podcast. But now what I'm doing is whatever I do on YouTube, I'm replicating over to the audio podcast. So whichever one, you know, you, you, whichever format you like better, you're going to get the same content, but it's all at my website, robgoodwin.com. And also what got me into this whole situation to begin with is years ago, I started a Facebook group called the ketogenic bodybuilding Facebook group. And I thought about six people would join it. I just thought it'd be something that me and my friends could do on Facebook where we could trade information. I never thought it would be popular. I wouldn't think anybody would want to combine a ketogenic diet with bodybuilding high intensity training, but turns out they did. And now it's got about 11, 12,000 very active members who are very passionate people. So that's a cool place too. So consider joining that, but it's all in the website. All right. Thanks very much, Rob. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's been my absolute pleasure. I'd love to do it again sometime.